Welcome to my dirty farm truck. I was born in Seattle and grew up in central Washington in a rural community of Wenatchee. This is where I was first exposed to the livestock in the neighborhood where I lived. Uh, my fond memories are of feeding the grass across the fence, pulling tall grass out of the ditch and feeding it across the fence to the animals that were in overgrazed pastures. I remember my first rodeo that a coworker of my father's took us to, and I was absolutely glued to the fence. And from then on, I wanted to be a cowboy, a rancher, and a rodeo rider. Uh, one fond memory of my childhood is uh, Christmas of 1994, when I received my first farm, a toy beef herd set. Big influences in my life have been my parents who always encouraged me to follow my dreams. Uh, my ancestors, my great grandfather was a Belgian Brabant draft horse uh, breeder. And also my mother's side, they were uh, lavender greenhouses in Toronto. And so I have this long line of farming and agriculture in my background but not a direct connection to that background. The biggest dream of my childhood was spending my days with animals and feeding my community and being able to wear this cowboy hat for my job. My parents were older when they had me and so that gave me a unique growing up. In my teenage years, uh, I had a lot of teen angst and energy and so I expressed that through becoming a professional mountain bike rider, uh, riding slope style. So. My dreams of becoming a rodeo cowboy kind of came true by riding a steel horse, traveling across the country many, many hours in the car to get to an event to perform in front of an audience, just like if I was a rough stock rodeo rider, only riding professional slope style mountain bikes. But like rodeo, it was a very dangerous activity. So uh, injuries built up to the point where I could no longer ride a mountain bike. And that was when I reverted back to my dream of becoming uh, a cowboy and a rancher. And when I discovered that regenerative livestock management is a way that I could both be a rancher, but also contribute to the solutions to solve climate change, I really found my dream job.
I studied outdoor rec and adventure tourism at Capilano University. And this was because I thought I wanted to build small businesses in mountain biking as a sustainable activity. As my injuries no longer allowed me to ride mountain bikes, I reverted back to that dream of producing food. And through university, I got very involved with student politics and learned more about uh, food security problems and sustainability challenges. I took my interest in small business where I thought I'd build businesses in mountain biking and switch that to building businesses around local food security uh, by building my farm, allowing me to spend time with the animals uh, and then produce food for my community in a way that was sustainable in a venue where I could teach about sustainability. Uh, my involvement with the Capilano Students' Union really allowed me to learn about systems of governance to the point where today I am involved with many boards, the Small Scale Meat Producers Association. Uh, Growing Opportunities is the vegetable production op organization and a nonprofit promoting food security here in Nanaimo. Uh, I also am part of the Coombs Farmers Institute and also I'm the president of the District A Farmers Institute, which represents farmers on the Sunshine Coast, Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands. And then lastly, I'm also the vice president of the Island Roots Farmers Market to ensure that our market is progressing so that we can be an incubator for farmers and producers and vendors to test their skills, build their businesses, and really flourish in this community. As a student, I had my first experience with crowdfunding uh, where we raised money for Bikes for Tykes, which is a bike shop led initiative to take old bicycles and refurbish them for kids at Christmas. So what my partner and I did is we hosted an event to air one of the Red Bull mountain bike events that I would have competed in. So we did a live airing, a beer and burger and a silent auction. And what I learned there was a key piece of crowdfunding where you can match donations to have a much bigger impact. So the money that we raised was matched by the bike shop that we partnered with that put on the Bikes for Tykes. And then Specialized Bikes, this big multinational company, they then matched what both the contribution that myself and the bike shop put together. So that was able to four times what we had raised, which really made a significant impact. And we raised over $10,000 for the Bikes for Tykes program, which meant that all of the 200 bicycles that went out into the community all went with a brand new helmet. I've worked a lot of jobs, but for the most part, I was a bike mechanic while I was an athlete. That was a great job to supplement my travel. And then after university, I tried a lot of different jobs in order to pay the bills while I found my passion, which is this, the regenerative agriculture. All of those experiences have given me the skill set that allows me to run my business and to flourish as a young entrepreneur building multiple businesses 
to support food security here in Nanaimo. Parents were not surprised when I said I was making a go of being a full-time farmer. It's been my dream since I was a little boy. Not only that, but my family on my dad's side always thought I was a bit of a reincarnation of Uncle Worthy. Worthy Hecht was the son of my great-grandfather who raised Belgian Brabant draft horses. And Worthy was the last of my family to continue farming. And he was also a rodeo announcer for junior rodeos. So though I never met Uncle Worthy, I still wear his belt buckles and I have his felt cowboy hat. And so in the honor of Uncle Worthy, who always kept a couple cows, some horses and some pigs, I continue that farming tradition of my family. Regenerative agriculture is a movement by which we are improving the ecosystem through our farming practices. Nothing is truly sustainable. Nothing stays still. Either you are in a regenerating and improving practice or you're in a degradative, damaging practice. And so with every decision we make, we are looking to improve the ecosystem. And so I do that by fertilizing the fields with poultry that move in these chicken tractors that spread fertility evenly across the fields the way a diesel tractor would. Our grass grows super strong after being fertilized by the poultry to the point where we need to bring the ruminant animal in, the cows and the sheep, that prune the grass to keep it in its growing cycle. The same way that the deer and the bison would have interacted with the wild birds. In the forest where I sit now, this is where the pigs are raised, and they're the biological reset button. They reset the forest floor the way a large herd of elk or bears would in order to root out any of the invasive species and allow the natural species to come back. Regenerative agriculture is a way for us to produce food, but also improve our ecosystems and also improve the lives of our community through healthy food and through meaningful work. The gurus of the regenerative agriculture movement include Joel Salatin and Greg Judy. Those are the two number ones for me. Now, I also really appreciate Wendell Berry, who's an author of the 1977 title, The Unsettling of America. Joel Salatin's hero is Wendell Berry. And Wendell Berry for the last 70 years has been writing about the decrease in the rural population due to industrialization pushing people out of farming and into the cities. My dream is that we will see the increase in the rural population for the first time in over 150 years. And that will be made possible by the small farming movement and by the ecological farming movement needing more people to get involved with our farming systems. We need more people to create more production on each acre of land instead of having very inefficient, large-scale agriculture, working on vast acreages with these big machines in industrial farming. My philosophy in farming follows four pieces. So detach the land ownership from the farming. When I lived in Port Moody and started farming in an urban setting, I asked my landlord, well, we're not allowed to raise chickens in the backyard. Can I raise quail in our backyard? 
and he was pretty uncertain. He said, I don't want to attract wildlife and I don't want the neighbors to think it's weird. Neighbors. Ping. Instead of my backyard that was terraced and steep, I made a brochure and I went down the street to the neighbors and started asking, hey, may I use your backyard to raise quail? And if not your backyard, would you mind if it was the neighbor's yard? So I offered fertilizing their yard and the reward of the bounty of the eggs that I was gonna produce. So I started with one backyard where I found someone who was willing to let me raise quail in their yard. Now this is the same as what I do today by finding neglected and underused farmland here in Nanaimo and I put it back into production and use regenerative practices to increase the fertility and the productive capabilities to actually improve the value of the property for the landowner. The second principle is mobile infrastructure. When I lived in Port Moody, I built these little tiny quail tractors to fit in the backyards and those I was able to use wheels to roll them down the street into those backyards, but also every day move those across the landscape to fertilize the backyard. Modular. Well, I was still working in the city at the time. And so I would put my suit on, I would walk to the SkyTrain and on my way, I started with one backyard, but by the end of the summer I had five backyards. So I was stopping at these five backyards with five quail tractors and five sets of birds where I was able to scale up one at a time. Just like today with the electric fence and with the chicken tractors that I use, I'm able to scale up or down very quickly and easily to stay nimble with what I'm doing. The last piece is direct marketing. When I was raising quail in 2018, there was a car free day. And so that gave me the opportunity to sell while I didn't have my permits to sell food yet. So I created a membership to the Quail Club, a little punch card. And 10 families prepaid $10 for the first set of eggs. For the rest of the year, those 10 families were able to purchase everything that I could produce with the quail that I raised. I raised a total of 200 birds that year. And the males that were the meat birds, I did not have official inspected processing for them. And so I processed them to myself and I gifted them to the families. So every family member got to try at least one dinner bird of the quail that I produced. Today, I market at two farmer's markets that are year round. The Qualcomm farmer's market on Saturday mornings and the Wednesday market in Nanaimo at Bebbin Park from three till 6 p.m. Those are two year round markets because if my customers eat 52 weeks a year, I better be at the farmer's market 52 weeks a year. My goal is to hold on to as much of the food dollars I possibly can. The North American standard is that a farmer earns 14 cents of the food dollar. When you buy a box of cereal, the cardboard maker is making more than the grain farmer. In small farming, we need to change that by value adding and taking on as much of the food chain as possible.